Helps if I turn the sound up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just adjust the... Don't adjust your set. Sorry, I'm adjusting everything. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bald Explorer live reading of a, another book. Uh, and this book is, of course, the story of a Norfolk farm by Henry Williamson. We read chapters one and two yesterday. Uh, we're on chapter three. I explore a his, an historic house. Sorry about... Um, that will just wait for a few extra moments whilst people come along. I know uh, the lovely Julie will be very upset um, if we start without her because she was there a second ago and probably is going, what's happening? What's happening? Um, better just check that she's OK because she... Oh, there she is. There we go. Marvellous. Well done. Lovely Julia is there. That's fantastic. Uh Steve G, hello to you, Turbo Stream, Ed Loud, Trev's Travels, Days of Yours, and whoever else comes along who is watching, but without saying you're there. Without saying you're there. Sorry, just doing my cuffs. Cool. Well, welcome along. Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming along on another one. Let's have a slurp of coffee. And James Poulton is here, and Linda Kane, hi, I found you on the phone, but laptop having hissy fit and doesn't want to cooperate. Oh, yeah, we had uh, an, one of those things every now and again, get that situation where I set the stream up and then it's it just, and you go live and it says, I don't want to do it. Can you reset? And you have to reset the software. So, which means you make another stream. Then I have to go back and delete the pending one, come, one you know, one of the pending ones so that people don't look for the wrong thing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I just check that. My glasses are so filthy. No wonder I can't read anything. So just bear with me whilst I uh, quickly <gasps> clean them. There we go. Marvellous. All right, so we are... Let's see how we go with this. Um, I was listening, funnily enough, I was doing some research because I'm hoping to film tomorrow if the weather stays as it says it's going to stay. And I was doing a bit of research and I came across one of those... Oh, what do they call them? They're American free reading vo voxelox or something. Vo I can't remember what they call it. Voxelox or voice bot locks. It's they read public stuff in the public domain they, and anybody can do it. And again, I listened to one of those and somebody was reading an old uh, travel book from 1909 or something. And very good reader, but very monotonous voice. Uh, so there we go. Oh, it's Sean James Cameron. My book arrived, The Decline of an English Village. You will love it. It is a brilliant and beautifully written book. Uh, one that I would love to read live, but it's too recent and I can't do it. Hello to uh, Richard Suggett, who I've uh, been chatting to on the phone earlier. He's cleaning out his shed. Shall we get going? Have another slurp of coffee before it goes cold. I've made some more bread, so uh, it's rising in the kitchen. I say that, apropos of nothing. Oh, yeah, Librifox, LibriVox. That's the one. Um, yeah, beautifully, you know, he read, he read without making any mistakes, but he read in a very boring voice like this and said every single word absolutely correctly, but I didn't really feel I wanted to listen to him for any length of time. So let's crack on and see if I can do it slightly better. It was a dull morning, and after breakfast we set out to explore the old house which was about a dozen miles westward along the coast. Are you with me so far? <laughs> Sorry, I muck about. I muck about. It was a dull morning, and after breakfast we set out to explore the old house, which was a dozen miles westward along the coast. The seashore lay east and west, while I lay back in the comfort of the leather seat of Dick's car, he told me over his shoulder that during the Great War, zeppelins used to make their landfall at dusk along the coast, waiting there until dark when they moved inland to their raids. Often they were low, two or three thousand feet above the point, which now was a bird sanctuary, where in the summer thousands of terns nested. I don't know what kind of a bird a tern is, but I'm sure it's a very nice ground-nesting bird, presumably. 
Out of the right-hand window, as we drove on, I saw the sea below low cliffs of sand. I remembered those cliffs. Only a few days after I had arrived in 1912, it had started to rain hard, and after breakfast I'd gone to find a moorhen's nest in a pond near the village. I had meant to wade in and take the eggs and eat them for breakfast with fried bacon. But when I got to the pond, it was already brimming over its edge and the surface was lashing with striking drops. On my return, the village street was running with water and I amused myself standing in the middle of the road watching the fast flow breaking halfway upon my legs. Soon it was up to my knees I went home to the cottage, which was dark owing to the black sky. By midday, it was a torrent, and after lunch we paddled towards the beach, and I saw a gap in the cliffs through which was a footpath to the beach, torn wide and crumbling. Hang on a minute. Yeah, is this the same memory? I'm just checking that this is the same memory, because he's jumping in time. I hate it when they do that. Great masses of brownish clay were falling into the torrent from above and boats were washed out to sea. It was a terrific rain, about six inches falling in a few hours and half of Norfolk was flooded, including Norwich, the sewers and the drains of which were choked and burst open. When I cycled back to London a few weeks later, the roads were still torn and cut about by scores and in many places I, I had to wheel my bicycle I had to wheel my bicycle owing to the roughness of the heaps of strewn stones lying about. I didn't tell Dick about this memory. I thought it in mental pictures to myself because I didn't want to be tedious. Well, he's being tedious now, isn't he, telling us. I knew I was um, g garrulous, g g g g garrulous, garrulous, garrulous and often tired to check the flow of words which usually came from a ready tongue. At this period in my life I was disciplining myself, trying to slow down my nature to take life more easily. The country was changing, woodlands and sloping fields, and soon we came to vast level tracts of marshes stretching to the sea. They were grey and somewhat dull. Dick said it would make all the difference if the sun came out. The air of Norfolk was the keenest and clearest in England and the marshes were famous for the sea lavender and other maritime plants in summer. The road rose and fell and passed through the villages with cottages built of large pebbles or half flints and old bricks and Roman tiles. Some were Dutch in design and Flemish. Also, the Huguenots had settled here, leaving their pattern of farmhouse and cottage on the countryside. It was the least changed part of old England, with only a few visitors in summer. This was attractive to me after the Devon coast, which had changed so rapidly since I'd known it, becoming built upon and populous. I was keen to see the house which could be bought for a thousand pounds or so. Thousand pounds, can you imagine buying a house now, a big old rambling house for a thousand pounds? Gosh. Terns are seabirds in the family of, oh golly, can't pronounce that, Laridae. Laridae? And they have a worldwide distribution and are normally found near the sea, rivers, and wetlands, which include gulls. How do you. Lar, Laridae, is it? Laridae? I'm, I'm crap on words that don't aren't written phonetically <laughs> as you probably have noticed Dick pulled up under some trees at a bend in the road near a church it seemed a remote even desolate spot a man was walking behind a solitary cow up a narrow street I buttoned my raincoat to my neck and got out I wonder where we get the key said Dick the white-painted letters on the notice board beyond the flint garden wall were faded, and black boarding of the black boarding bordering of it was green with mildew. We walked down a gravel drive and came to the house. It had an, immem an immemorial beauty of 
immemorial, immemorial beauty of faded brick and flint with pinnacles and round towers and a tiled roof uneven with great age. But immediately I was disappointed because it was obviously far too large. While we were walking down to look at it from near the river, an old man with a stoop and a fringe of whiskers round an all-sad face appeared. He stopped and quizzed us. I felt I was obtru in obtruding, but I said, Do you know where we can get the key? This house is for sale, isn't it? He didn't reply at once, but looked away. At length, in a quavery voice, he said, Mr Stubblefield at Welk writes out orders to view. He was a subdued-looking grey little old man. He seemed disclined to talk further, so we left him and wandered about the deserted garden and went down to the river across the swampy ground. The river was muddy, moving along sluggishly. The house looked to be half decayed and gloomy, the keystone of one of the arches of the outbuildings was carved in the shape of a pig, the crest of the Bacon family, which had built the place there. Here it was, apparently, that Francis had written his books, also the, a modern author who had lived in the house fairly recently. Sorry about that, it's my phone. So it wasn't so remote a part of England as I had hoped. What do you think of it? It would be nice to look inside. inside. I, I, sorry, I'd like to look inside, wouldn't you? I've been inside, but I'd like to see it again. Shall we get an order to view? The local agent is at Welk, only four miles away. Let's go, shall we? Welk, or Welk next to the sea, to give its full name, had a narrow main street leading down to a view of marshes and the sea. A modern grain elevator arose above an old quay whereupon railway trucks were standing. A fisherman in blue slop and rubber-high boots passed with under his arm with a wicker... Sorry, a fisherman in blue sloop and rubber thigh boots passed under his arm a wicker skep filled... Skep, S-K-E-P, a wicker skep filled with shellfish. Two sailing ships were moored alongside the quay. It had an old-time air, which was pleasing to me. Returning up the narrow street, with its small shops almost touching one another, we sought and found the offices of Mr Stubblefield. A clerk sitting beside a fire in an early Victorian grate went up bare wooden steps and, coming down again, asked us up. In the room above, Mr Stubberfield rose from a table covered with papers to receive us. He was dressed in breeches and leggings and had a pleasing country voice, and I had the feeling that the place was much as it was when Jeffreys was writing Hodge and his masters. Yes, the old castle had been for sale for some time with 240 acres of land, there had been many inquiries about it, but the owner, Commander Trelawney, who lived in Cornwall, would not sell the house apart from the land, and no one wanted the land, unfortunately, said Mr Stubberfield. We got the order to view, and we left the car again among the trees by the church. The old man was not about, so we opened the front door and walked in. The place was dark the air cold and musty. Immediately I knew I could not live there. A sombre greyness was in every room, and the kitchen! It looked like a boiler room of an abandoned, well-worn steamship. How many tonnes of coke a week had been burnt in that crude central heating apparatus? Probably the pipes were choked with the hardy, chalky water. It felt to me to be an unhappy house, we went downstairs to the cellar under what might have been the billiard room, striking matches. The floor was rotten, the floor was dry rotten, with yellowish white patches of fungus creeping everywhere over the wood. We hurried up the stone steps again into the damp grey room and up a spiral staircase to the first floor. The bedrooms were better, but the floorboards, the walls, the ceilings, all had a feeling of exhaustion 
of fatigue unto death. Perhaps if the sun had been shining, shining, this feeling would have lessened in me, but I could not bear the place as it was. People do leave something of themselves or their sufferings and joys in a house, and these are often, if not always, caused by circumstances which surround them. Therefore, a badly placed or built house would cause more unhappiness than happiness. I wanted sunlight, air and soundness about me, not darkness and de 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 decadence. Not darkness and decadence. The rafters seemed almost entirely rotten and were hung with bats. I wanted to get out into the air. Dick seemed a bit disappointed about my reaction to the house. It's a rather grey day, of course, he said. It was raining again. The old man was coming slowly along the path through the long, withered grasses where he stood where stood a few straggling trees. He ignored us and went his bent back way to the outbuildings. We walked to the car and drove home. A slurp of coffee here. The next day, the sun was shining. I had an impulse to see the old castle again, although it was quite possible... It was quite impossible as a place to live in. They might take a thousand for it. You never know with these old places, said Dick. And quite honestly, I don't think it's as bad as you think. The roof will probably stand another two or three centuries. We did look over it rather fairly carefully a year or two ago. Well, anyway, there was no harm in having another look. An hour later we were once more walking up the stairs of the estate agent's office in Welk next to the sea. At the brief interview with Mr Stubberfield I said something which eventually altered the course of my life. I told a lie, or rather, I inferred a lie. I knew I didn't want to buy the house, and I felt somewhat mean in asking again for an order to view it. So... To excuse myself, to myself, I said, I suppose the owner wouldn't san sell the land apart from the house, would he? Mr Stubberfield's face shows surprise. Well, he said, that's uh, <coughs> certainly an original suggestion. Everybody so far has complained that it's the land which prevents them buying the house. I'll uh, I'll write off to Commander Trelawney, solicitors, and make inquiries, if you like. But I ought to be truthful with you. The land is in bad condition. It's uh, been treated more of a game preserve than a farm. Who's the tenant? Do I know him? asked Dick's wife. Uh, Mr Sidney, Mr Sidney Strawless. I felt myself to be mean, the poor fellow writing a letter, when I had not the least intention of buying the land. With another order to view, we returned and sought out the old man with tired eyes and thistle-down whiskers. I gave him two shillings, but his eyes remained as before. Again we walked up the spiral staircase, again we went from bedroom to bedroom, down the passage and up to the rafters, and down once more to the cellars. Again it was a relief to be in the open air. We walked down to the river and crossed a small brick bridge to the farm beyond. Black thistles and the frost wreckage of nettles lay everywhere on the grass. Rotten sticks and branches lay under the trees. The lane, or road, leading to the buildings was all water and the yard we looked into seemed nearly three feet deep in mud. Flint walls were broken down, every gate was decayed or fallen to pieces, tiles were off, showing rotten woodwork patched with dry rot. The place seemed entirely forsaken. We walked on poor grassland up a hill. Near the top we saw the coast that we had come along from Welk and the red roofs of the cottages in the village. Walking to the crest of the hill, we came to pine trees and a superb view of them through the water meadows and distant arable beyond to the white lines 
of breakers on a shallow coast. Here's, um, here's a picture of the, the lane that he supposedly looked at. Unfortunately, the paper is uh, loose. It's loose in the hoose. What a place for a house, said Dick's wife. And look, there's a lane leading out to the road beyond. It could be made up for a drive. As she spoke, the sun came out from behind a cloud and colour flowed into the landscape. The boles of the crooked pines glowed brown and their dark heads became green. Even the faded grass had life. We went down the hill again and walked through the neglected grounds of the old castle. The notice board had interest for me now, as I had seen a bit of the... Sorry, the, the notice board had an interest for me now that I had seen a bit of the place. It was an excellent sporting property, it declared. 242 acres with a trout stream, duck, uh, sorry, duck decoy and a well-placed coverts. The woods had looked nice from the road. What a place for children. They could wander and fish and in the stream and fish in the stream. They could live on the game. Norfolk was the home of the wild pheasant. Suppose I became a farmer. The thought startled me. My boyhood picture of myself as a farmer returned to me. Windles, my eldest son, playing with the lead horses and trees and hurdles, had said he wanted to be a farmer, and of course the thing was impossible. I knew nothing about farming. Quite impossible. Supposing I became a farmer? Dick drove slowly homeward in the twilight, while from the back seat I stared at the watery meadows dissolving into the winter's night. We had tea at a hotel on the quay of the village a couple of miles away. This was a fashionable place in the short season. I inferred from Dick... Sorry, uh, this was a fashionable place in the short season, I inferred from what Dick had said. In summer, 14-foot sailing dinghies made, a, made of polished cedar wood raced th in the creeks. Few trippers came here. It was so different from Devon. Tea was served by a waiter wearing a tailcoat and a white tie. The only other visitor in the room was a man reading The Shooting Times. In the middle of the tea, the waiter bowed to him. You're wanted on the telephone, sir, by Mr Sidney Strawless. The name made me alert. Dick had heard it too. After a while, the man returned, smiling. Dick's wife rang for more hot water. The waiter came into the room again. When he had brought the water, the visitor asked for a whisky and soda, saying to him, I'm told it's the finest small shoot in Norfolk, which of course means England, very high birds. Yes, sir, it's a good as... It's, sorry, yes, sir, it's as good a shoot as Mr Strawless is a shot. Dick and I exchanged glances. Even as we were sitting there, a letter was on its way to London, asking if the owner of the finest small shoot in England would sell it, although buying it was, of course, not my intention. We felt we were spectators of a mild comedy called In Darkest Norfolk, especially when the door opened a few moments later and a tall man with black hair wearing treads strode into the room and the visitor rising said, Mr Sidney Strawless, I presume. Good evening, sir, replied the newcomer, quietly as he sat down. I tried to listen to what they were saying, though I felt I ought not to be listening. Apparently the visitor was on the shoot tomorrow. I heard the words, duck, snipe, woodcock, lots of it. We usually get a hundred and a hundred and fifty birds at this time. With the intuition that makes a man aware of being listened to, the newcomer, after a glance round at our table lowered his voice. When we finished our tea, I packed a pipe and then sought for matches. The visitor, seeing me patting my pockets, offered me a box. Oh, 
thanks very much. Are the uh, geese in yet? I asked him. Yes, replied the farmer, but they've gone away again. Looks like a fine sporting country. He looked at me keenly. Returning his look, I said, Isn't that your farm opposite the old castle at Creek? After a pause, he said, It is. Why? Oh, we've been looking over it today. I wonder why such a farm wasn't sold so long ago. He got to his feet and said, almost violently, I'll tell you why, because they're looking for a mug. Isn't it a good farm, then? It looked rather pleasant to me. He snorted. You can't do anything with that hilly land. Are you a farmer, then? Oh, no, I know nothing about farming. I felt almost like a conspirator with Dick as we drove home to his mill cottage above the fishing village. We discussed it over and over again that night as we played our two evening games of draughts, and then I went to bed feeling that on the morrow I must go back to Creek and really look at the farm properly. Of course, I said I wasn't really serious, yet the farm was in a beautiful position with its hills and woods and meadows. We are now on chapter four. Oh, that's quite exciting, isn't it? It's quite exciting. I uh, hope you're enjoying that. Chapter four, I am driven by an idea. I returned along the coast road the next morning, alone, in the Silver Eagle. It was a clear day, and as the road moulded itself under me with rise and fall and turn, I felt the acceleration, sorry, I felt the exhilaration of the keen Arctic air. Now there was width and depth in the sky and on the whole earth and sea. I knew why many artists had come to paint along this coast with its clear lights and distances. It was a land of far extending marsh and watery dikes, windmills, grey North Sea and teams of horses drawing ploughs. How different from Devon with its small hilly fields and great stone-backed hedges, rushing streams and soft, moist air. I felt like an explorer as I passed through the slow and gentle East Anglian villages. At length, I came to the road. I was beginning to remember. The farm lay on the left, beyond the river, which here made a horseshoe curve with rushy meadows immediately below. When I stopped to climb out the grass, onto the grassy bank and stand beside the river, shots began, began to come flatly across the distant trees. Looking to the woods, I saw several figures in the meadow firing at birds which were flying over. The firing was rapid, and I saw many pheasants fall. About fifty or sixty reports came in less than two minutes. I went on, stopping my car by the old castle, saw half a dozen big saloon cars standing on the drive. I wanted to go and watch the sport, but I thought it might be an intrusion, so I went to Welk next to the sea to get further particulars of the land. Mr Stubberfield was just about to set forth for an auction, he told me, but he was not leaving for a minute or two. I asked him if he had anything from the owner, and he replied that there had been hardly time since my visit yesterday afternoon. He gave me particulars of the tenancy, saying that it was left to Mr Strawless for a £100 a year, including the sporting rights. In the old days, the land and sporting rights had let for £284. There was a tithe of just under £80 a year, and also drainage rates at about £18, both of which the landlord paid. Also, Mr Stubberfield said there was income tax on the £100 a further £22.10 shillings, making that about 120 a year. He ought not, of course, tell me these things as he wanted to sell the property, but later I might want to know such particulars, so I may as well tell you now. Really, the rent was £100 Really, a rent of £100 was very low indeed, but the trouble was in the lack of a farmhouse, and Mr Strawless, who farmed a thousand acres of land next to the castle farm, had offered that rent for it, and as it was the only offer, Commander Trelawney had decided it was better than letting the land revert entirely to weeds and rubbish. 
had probably noticed the weeds. It was a bit, it was a pity, but many farms were in a like condition. Land was not considered much of investment nowadays, concluded Mr Stubberfield. I dare to ask how much Commander Trelawney might want for the land, while feeling I was being drawn into a trap that I had prepared for myself. Perhaps I was the mug they were looking for. Mr Stubberfield replied that the solicitors were now asking for 7,000 for the land and the house, and he couldn't say how much they were prepared to consider for just the land. As we were going down the stairs, I said, I suppose you couldn't give me any idea of the value of the land or how much capital it would take to farm it. Somewhat difficult questions to answer offhand, sir. I understand that the property sold for a little over 11,000 before the war. Colonel Trelawney, the commander's brother, Colonel Trelawney, the commander's brother, spent three or four thousand on putting it in order, too. Including the monstrous central heating plant, I thought. Seven thousand pounds? I hadn't seven hundred. It's good land, you know. It used to grow fourteen coombs of barley in, the, uh, barley in those days. Oh, really? I didn't know what a coombe was, and, as for barley... All I knew was that it waved like the sea in June when the green beard was coming in. Have you done much farming in Devon, Mr... Uh, Williamson? Oh, yes, yes, of course. No, I'm, I'm afraid I... Uh, I'm afraid I never remember... I'm afraid I never remember my... Sorry. I'm afraid I never remember names myself. Well, Williamson is a well-known Norfolk name. Do you know Norfolk? I used to come here as a boy. It's a pleasant spot, isn't it? Well, I must be going. Uh, have I got your address? I wonder if you wouldn't mind leaving it in the office downstairs. I've got to go to Great Wordingham Market to uh, grade fat cattle. Uh, we have some very fine box-fed beasts in some of the farms still, though I'm afraid farmers lose on such beasts nowadays. Uh, good day, sir. I'll write to you as soon as I hear. I gave my name in at the office. Coombe, grading, cattle, box fed beast. What did these terms mean? Great Wordingham Market, Crete, Welk by the Sea. What simplicity in those names. How different it all was after Devon. I felt the tiny office... I left the tiny office with its bills of auctions and sale and went into the pub nearby with a feeling of helplessness. Anyhow, it wasn't any more strange really than going to live in Devon after the war on an unconsidered impulse, or the fact that I was a father of children, or the author of several books. Hadn't I bought the field in the Devon hilltop on impulse and never regretted it? Nevertheless, I felt a damp kind of hollow inside me. I had some beer and bread and cheese. How did it go? asked Dick on my arrival back in the, in the darkness. I told him what had happened, adding that I had gone to have a look at the buildings and talked with a labourer who was feeding some great old sows. I asked how many birds they'd shot that day, and he replied, several. How many was several? I further inquired. Oh, about five score, he'd said. I asked if it was a good farm, and he said, who's been telling you otherwise? Then it wasn't ruined. What's wrong with it? he asked. Well, look at the mud, I said. Always mud on farms, he'd retorted. What sort of farmer was strawless? Oh, a good master. He let them alone. I asked him what a coombe was. It's a sack. How much of a sack? Half a quarter. Then what was a quarter? Two coombe, he said. Had he worked there for many years? Oh, several then he asked me if I was going to buy the farm. What did he advise, I countered. It's been let go, he said, after glancing round his shoulder, but you don't let them know, do you? I liked him. That night, sitting by the fire while the rain beat on the window, I began to imagine my small boys playing in the woods, building a hut and roasting a rabbit over a wood fire, sleeping out in the summer and running wild on our own land. Our own land? What a grand sound that had. 
It was a fine farm, those woodlands and wild pheasants, and there was a duck decoy too. Mr Stubberfield had told me. The woods often were full of woodcock in the early winter. I hadn't shot for years, fifteen years, since 1922, but my mind had no objection to shooting for the pot. My vegetarian phrase phase was over, and with it the mental misery I'd been going through during the post-war phase of humanitarianism. By heavens, what was I doing, thinking of the farm in terms of a fantasy story? Was I prepared to milk every cow every morning at five o'clock, to feed a pig and then go to market and haggle, as I'd seen the Devon farmers do, for hours, over half a crown, while they while they drank and had more cider, did I seriously think that I could enjoy such a mode of life? Was, wasn't was I unpunctual, unreliable, careless about money? Also, how was I going to buy the farm? If I had saved five or six years before when my books had sold well, then I might now, at 40, be able to think of such an investment. It would be nice to have Henry as a neighbour in the summer, when we're up here, wouldn't it? said Dick's wife. When he's writing about when he's writing that book about wild goose, said Dick. Also, I think a book about farming would make a good sale. Was this the way out? Would an active life rid me of the periods in which life seemed but in vain endurance to put some purpose I saw dimly in the future as an inner call to urge to be of use in the New England. I'm not sure how I, whether I read that right. Since writing my book about the ex-soldier, I had been generally unhappy and had put that down to these prolonged moods of an inactive life. To learn to write, I had gone into the wilderness and lived as a solitary. Now that phase was past, having a vacancy in my life. I longed, as Lawrence had longed when he had joined the Royal Air Force, to change myself, to become normal, to be simply content with life as it lived around me. Now, if I became a farmer, wouldn't I grow the root in the ground that poor T.E. failed to grow for himself? In the glow of such thoughts, I saw myself walking behind horses, singing, as I ploughed, and then going home, changing and washing and eating a hearty meal, after which I wrote 500 words, the maximum laid down for himself by Arnold Bennett, who had seemed to me to be naturally a happy man with a full life, and then relax as a cat or dog before the fire. There was farming blood in me. My mother's family had been farmers. Some of them had farmed the same land under the dukedom of Bedford for more than four centuries. My father's family had been landowners until comparatively recently in the Midlands and in the north of England. Surely I would be able to succeed as a farmer. Two days later, in the Barbarian Club, I spoke to a Wiltshire farmer who had made a reputation as a writer and broadcaster. It was Dick who had first introduced him to reading the reading public by asking him to write a book which fully lived up to its title of Farmer's Glory, which surely would be read as long as the sun shone on English corn. I asked him, did he think it was a good time to buy land? Land has never been so cheap for 150 years, he replied. Also, he said, it's very difficult to farm and write at the same time. My farming suffered since I became a writer. I cannot give it the time it should have. Farming is a whole-time job. Also, writing is a whole-time job. They clash. Then I asked, how much capital was needed for a 200-acre farm? It, it, it depended entirely on the district and what sort of farming one went in for he replied, but £10 an acre was usually reckoned to be the absolute minimum. After midnight, after midnight supper of beer and kippers at the club, I'd, I'd seen a grand film, Hollywood, Broadway, Song and Dance, Beautiful Girl Show, I composed a night telegram to Devon asking for my mail to be redirected 
to the, bar the Barbarian Club. When a score or so of letters came, two of them immediately affected me. One was from my mother, written from a Blackheath nursing home, telling me that she was not very well, but not to worry. But if I had time, would I go and see her? And the other was from the agent at Welk next to the sea, saying that Messrs. so-and-so, the solicitors, had been instructed by Commander Trelawney that he would be prepared to consider an offer for the land. If I would make one, Mr Stubberfield would communicate it immediately to Messrs. so-and-so. That afternoon I went to see my mother. I had not seen her for several months, and immediately observed the change in her. And I knew, with feelings I tried to hide, that I would have to fortify myself to help her through her agony. In childhood and boyhood my mother had meant much to me, perhaps the link between us, as in the case of D.H. Lawrence and his mother, had been, had been stronger than its normal. On my return home after serving with the infantry in 1914 as a volunteer two years under military age, I'd found it impossible to resume the old relationship of affection, we lived in different worlds, and now, although I was supposed to be grown up and was a parent myself, all the old anguish came over me and I found myself talking wildly about the war and another war which would arise if, at the, same ment if the same mentality ruled England. I had spoken like that during the battles of 1914 to 18, to the distress of both my parents, who had believed in the righteousness of war, or at least in the wickedness of one nation and the virtue of the other. Struggling with myself to divert this overstrong flowing of feeling, I told her about my visit to Norfolk and how I liked the country and was thinking about going to live there. With memories of the vast Atlantic sunsets over the Western Ocean, my mother said, Oh, but the sun is in the wrong place. It sets over the land. My mother always loved the sun. Sorry, my mother always loved the sun. She responded to it as a butterfly in spring, and her memories of her children playing by the edge of an unilluminated sea were upon her, for she was thinking of her grandchildren on that same beach, lapped by the North Sea so coldly and different indifferent from the warm and glowing Atlantic of the West, and I saw that she dreaded the darkness. No one can make farming pay these, dears. No one can make farming pay nowadays, dear. Marjorie's husband lost most of his capital in two years. It's, a very, it's very bad, she told me. They're all going to give up the farm after all these years. Mother, I'm not like the others. I must do something with my life. Writing is not a living. Anyhow, I've achieved what I set out to do, and I would like to work with my body. I'm afraid farming is finished in England, dear. It's all industry now. We cannot put the clock back, and however hard we try. She sighed, and I could see that she was in pain. I put my hand on her brow, thinking how small it was, and childlike and with the thin faded hairs and the darkening of eyes. This dread thing that was killing her was due to white bread, to wrong values, to industrialism, to unnatural ideas which had come upon European man. My mother was always over-anxious and afraid. Hush, my child, hush, do not say such things. How many times in the past had she said that to her wayward child, who was so off who so often protested so much who often protested against so much that was done and said by her as i stroked her forehead i thought of the old saying only the truth can make ye whole i wish she could die soon to cease in her sleep and to find peace and her sensitive spirit that she found so seldom in life when my mother died I knew that I would have some money left in trust by my grandfather. It would probably be enough to buy the farm, and I shrank from asking her for the particulars for this trust. Even so, the thought had occurred to me, so what was the difference, except as a matter of sensibility? 
I knew how she lived in her grandchildren. I longed to say her, Mother dear, do not be afraid. The children will be happy and fearless, strong and confident to make the new world out of the wreckage of the old, in which you, a tiny unit, are perishing. And I too, perhaps, in time. Mother, the salmon dies after spawning, and the floods of spring wash its de -lust its dislusted dislusted body to the great sea again, to dissolution, and return to the fount of life, even as eggs are hatching in the pure gravel beds of its racial origin. origin. And so your children, through me, your son, will live happily, because they are, are natural and on, na on native land. But how could these thoughts be uttered? I muttered that she would soon be well, and yes... She said with a smile, don't worry, dear, I'll soon be well and happy again. So I went away feeling small and useless because the truth was not between us, even at this last. The journey to Devon was long and cold and I was exhausted when I arrived and not happy to be home again. Perhaps if I'd had a strong whisky and soda before the fire... Sorry, perhaps if I'd had a strong whisky and soda before the fire, I would not have remained depressed and disappointed at my homecoming, but drinking spirits to maintain one's equanimity seemed a weak and decadent thing to do. After boiled eggs and toast and some tea, however, I felt more confident and told... Oh, golly. Low... Loiet... What? Loietta. Loietta? Loetitia. This is a name. And maybe someone can tell me how you pronounce it. L O E T I T I A. Loet. Loetitia. Lo I can't even. Lotitia. Lotitia. Is it Lotitia? Lotit. Lo. Anyway. Lo. <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce that. Lo. Lo. Loetitia. I don't know. Anyway his wife, presumably, about the farm and the house. The farm sounds nice, dear, she said. And if you think you could buy it and there's money... Sorry. And if you think you could buy it, there's the money I had when Papa died. It is a, a lovely farm. We'd all have our own wood and game. We could grow and uh, own wheat for bread and the children would love it. They could have ponies. And honestly, I think the land would be soon be the only sound investment... The economic structure which brings in cheap and frozen food to the detriment of the soil and the people of Britain can't last forever. Everyone thinks, everyone who thinks knows about it, but no one seems to know what to do about it. I suppose I'm as different, indifferent to money as most writers, so long as it's, I'm not really short of cash, and investments bore me, and we've got five children, and should look to the future. What do you think? I think you're right, dear, said... Loietta Titty, whatever her name is. A bit like Leap. I can't even pronounce that. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm saying Loietta Titty for now. <laughs> it's stupid, but I can't pronounce it. I think you're right, dear, said Loietta Titty, as she knitted a woollen jacket for the baby in the cradle asleep beside the hearth. But do you really? It sounds a lovely farm. But don't you think... But do you think you could work it? Don't think me critical, dear, but you do get impatient sometimes, don't you? There, I didn't mean to be critical. You're like Winless. He gets impatient and easily upset. In the nursery, yes, with toys, I've seen him, but if he worked with his body, he'd slow down and grow like a tree in, in proper soil. I lit my pipe and laid back, my slippered feet... I lit my pipe and lay back, my slippered feet to the blaze of the beech sticks. I saw myself with a gun under my arm. I'm going to have to finish in a minute. I saw myself with a gun under the arm, returning slowly, contentedly, with a brace of pheasants in a bag slung over my shoulder. I had a fat red face and my eyes saw life easily. My books were popular. I wrote them without any revisions and the style was full of a lazy or tired man's clichés. 
I recalled my first sentence, consciously written for a book, in 1918. Chapter 1 began, the weather, was bu- well, the weather was beyond reproach, and the sun shone in a cloudless sky. In those words, I had sat in an asbestos hat at Etables? Etables? I don't know where that is, somewhere, somewhere in France by the sounds of things waiting to join a draft going up to the battle, which eventually broke the Siegfried line before Cambry. Had I felt again that the hot... I'm I'm, I'm probably worn out of read. I'm just going to get to the end of this paragraph. I'm going to struggle to get to the end of this paragraph. I will get there. I will get there. Uh, But now it's all jumping about in my face. I was doing so well as well. Um, he wrote these words at a tables, wherever that is, waiting to join a draft going up to the battle which eventually broke the Siegfried line before Cambrai. I had felt again the hot summer day in Devon, the still sunlight of the dusk on the sunken lane, the butterflies, the grasshoppers rising in the hedges, the yellow hammers singing on the single telegraph wire, and from high ground... The Atlantic was azure, absolutely smooth and still. The curious thing was that most readers got a better picture from such a worn phrase as the weather was beyond reproach than from a studied and meticulous building up of the colour, form and sensuous impression. Why rack oneself to death, as Conrad did, writing prose that only a few appreciated? Why write prose at all? It was unnatural to sit hour after hour, day after day, week after week, getting more and more deceptic while projecting life and vitality into an imaginary world. Much easier to be normal and natural, to go with the tide, to be uncaring about the slow decline and decadence of human life about one. Yeah, this goes goes on a little bit long. Sighing and I'm, oh, wait a minute. There's a there's an end. I just one more parrot, one more parrot. Bear with me, one more parrot. Because there's a there's a sort of natural ending. Yes, it was better to be ordinary and natural. I saw myself with the gun under my arm and the brace of pheasants in my bag, pausing to admire the still clear air of the East Anglian East Anglian evening. Behind me, the stubble of a good harvest and the stacks beginning to be sharply outlined against the western sky. It would be a change to see the modest little sunsets of the east after the great ocean-flaring sky colours of the west. Poor, neglected East Anglian farms, big flint and brick barns ruinous, farm labourers on the dole, no one caring about the cornlands of Britain, absentee landlords, nobody like, nobody like a historic coke of Norfolk, of whom I'd heard from Dick, altering the face of England, so that the faces of ordinary country people were happier. There was no one pleading for them, no one prepared to ruin himself for a cause in which he believed. The well-being of the people he believed, the cause of which he believed, the well-being of the people of the land of Britain. What a book I could write of my experiences. I wasn't I wasn't really egotistical. I wanted to see a change, an alteration, a revolution of people's minds so that the whole wheat bread should be made and sold again to the people. To hell with big business that put dividends before the health of people. I wanted to do something. Words were not enough. What had Lawrence written in his Seven Pillars of Wisdom and then in another mood taken out of the final version? Oh, and then he he quotes he quotes Lawrence. But I'm going to stop. I'll stop there because um, I, I don't want to get myself into a tizzy. But that's fascinating. That was interesting. Now I, I was enjoy. I was enjoying that. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I saw you ch- chatting about various things, but I, as ever, probably nothing to do with what I'm on about. Uh, I'm wondering if Welk next to the sea is Wells next to the sea in disguise. Oh, could be. Typical that you. You reel in with a grand and then increase it sevenfold. Oh, wheel you in with a grand. Oh, I see. A coom is a four bushel bag. Now we need to know is how much is a bushel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Arnold Bennett liked an omelette. Farmer's Glory, written by A.G. Street in 1932. There we go. 
Uh, I was wondering how he would afford the farm. Morning Glory, composed by Tim Buckley, 1965. He's on a roll. Narrowboat, blah, blah, blah. Richard, see you this evening. Yes, that's it. Anyway, there we go. Thank you very much for all your comments and for listening. Uh, you get any parcels in the post today, Richard? Uh, no, nothing, nothing in the post today. Very enjoyable, very nice. Thank you. I've got your video that you've sent, which I have yet to download, which I will download about half past six. Uh, that was great. Could see you enjoying it. Yes, I did enjoy that, actually. Uh, Sean, you've changed your name again, unless I am mistaken. Sean's Kitchen Garden. Yes, enjoying this book too. Good. I'm glad everyone's enjoying it. Grand. I'm desperate to, to go and answer a call of nature, so I'm going to go and do that. Thank you so much for joining me. See you again. What's today? Friday. Oh, Monday. Monday. Monday's the next day. Oh, how how sad. But anyway... It's all quite good fun. Thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. And I will catch up with you uh, if you're watching the Vogue show tonight at 8 o'clock. If not, I will have a video for you tomorrow morning. And then uh, this will be carry on on Monday. Thank you very much to Julia. And um, I don't know if Judith was there, uh, to be honest. I haven't uh, seen her name. But... Uh, we don't really need moderation on this one because most people are very good. Anyway, th uh, but we did. We, occasionally we do. Anyway, I'm going to go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.